So today, uh, I'm just going to be giving like a brief tour. I don't have a lot of time. It's a completely different programming language from JavaScript, so um, I, I can't really you know, teach you the language in half an hour. Uh, but what I can do is give you some highlights of what I think are some of the most exciting uh, and interesting parts of Elm. Um, and give you just a, a little bit, a little taste of what it's like to work with an Elm program. The Elm website calls Elm a delightful language for reliable web apps. I think this is a nice summary, and I'll, I'll dig into uh, how, it, how it accomplishes this. So Elm is a language, a programming language. It compiles to JavaScript. It has its own package ecosystem, so uh, you're, not, you're not dependent on NPM or Yarn or whatever. Um, and it's focused on building browser apps. I say that because it uh, is not focused on building server apps, for the time being at least. Some people are experimenting with that, uh, but it's very much kind of a Wild West area. It's, it's really focused on building uh, client-side browser applications. So it is a different language than JavaScript, with different semantics, different syntax, different data structures. Um, it's not just uh, something like TypeScript, for example, or CoffeeScript are much closer to JavaScript than Elm. It's, it's really quite different. Um, so for example, but some of the things are you know, not too different. You still have functions. You still have values. Uh, you can still do a, a, a lot of the same things, just in slightly different ways. So this is JavaScript. Uh, here's a function where we take an array of numbers and we return uh, a new array that, uh, where each of the numbers is incremented by one. So this is using some ES6 syntax for the arrow function in there. Uh, but this is you know, pretty, uh, just a simple example. Um, this is what that might look like in Elm. Uh, there would be different ways of doing this, uh, but this is a simple way. Um, so here we're defining a function called increment all again. Uh, numbers is an argument. Um, and we are using the map function from the list module to say that we want to map this function over the numbers argument. Um, so notice a few things here. One is um, uh, it's called a list and not an array. That's because it's actually a different data structure. It's an immutable data structure, which means that instead of mutating it in place, we're always going to be making new versions of it and returning those new versions. Uh, so that has some nice properties that let us build apps in, uh, in nice new ways. Um, and you can read all about the benefits of that in other places. But for now, I'll just focus on some of the practicalities. So um, you, know, you can see that the function argument comes first instead of second. There's some good reasons for that. But you know, most of these are pretty minor differences. Uh, the syntax can seem pretty strange at first. But ultimately, you can get used to all the syntax in an afternoon or so. Um, so Another element of Elm that's different from JavaScript is that it is statically typed. So optionally, we can include a type annotation for our increment all function. And here's what that annotation would be in this case. Um, it's uh, use a colon to talk about the type of something. So we're saying the type of increment all is a function. I, I'm saying function because I see the arrow there. So that arrow means it's a function from one thing to another thing. So it's a function from a list of numbers. It takes a list of numbers as an argument, in other words. And it returns another list of numbers. Um, so some other, uh, just to kind of orient yourself in uh, you know, the space of all programming languages, uh, what, Elm is a functional language, meaning that uh, what, what, you're, what you're doing when you write Elm code is almost entirely writing f functions which take values as arguments and return new values as uh, return values. Meaning that um, what those functions 
don't do is uh, they don't mutate values in place, and they don't have unmanaged side effects, meaning you can't have a function that um, uh, calls out to some web service without you knowing it, because the way that it, you use a function in Elm to call it to a web service is reflected in its type. So that comes to the next point. Uh, it's statically typed. It has a what I think is a really nice type system that comes from a lot of uh, research over the past few decades. Uh, but really, what the uh, creator of the language, Evan Zaplicki, uh, has tried to do is, is take a lot of that research and bring it into the mainstream and make it really friendly for people new to the language and maybe even new to programming in general. Um, so a lot of that research is in the ML family of languages. Uh, the syntax and semantics of Elm um, really place it firmly in this family. Uh, some other languages in this family of languages, aside from ML and standard ML, are Haskell, OCaml, and PureScript. Uh, there are others as well. Um, but you might have heard of some of those. Uh, so, but, but you don't need to know any of those languages to get started with Elm, although Elm, if you are interested in eventually learning about those languages, Elm can be a really good place to start. So this is all you know, interesting trivia about Elm, but why is this actually good? Why, what, what makes Elm actually worthwhile to use for your own applications? This is something some of you might have seen. Um, I, I know I've seen it a lot, not just in JavaScript, but in lots of different languages. In Ruby, you know, it looks a little bit different. In Ruby, it looks like, uh, you know, no method error on nil or something. Um, but ultimately, you know, this comes from the fact that objects in JavaScript can have lots of different kinds of properties on them. And uh, you might assume that the object you're getting as an argument has some function on it that lets you do something. But maybe someone renamed that function, or maybe it no longer exists, or maybe you got null when you expected to get a number or something. Uh, here's another one that comes up a lot. Um, you might think you got an object and you try to do property access, but it was undefined because someone didn't provide an, uh, that argument at all to your function. Um, so this, this is actually, this just doesn't happen in Elm. There's no equivalence to these at runtime because uh, those kinds of exceptions just don't exist. Um, so in practice, Elm you know, essentially almost has no runtime exceptions. The almost is uh, because it is possible to have runtime exceptions, but um, they're in very particular places. Uh, for example, the Elm regular expression, uh, regular expressions in Elm use JavaScript's regular expressions under the hood. And so if you give an invalid string for that regular expression, um, that's going to show up at runtime. Uh, so, but unless you're you know, relying on user input to build those strings, then you're going to catch it during development anyway. Um, in practice, though, to give a sense of how little runtime exceptions happen unexpectedly, um, No Red Ink is a, a company and product that uses Elm, has uh, some tens of thousands of lines of Elm code at this point, and um, they've never encountered uh, a runtime exception in production. They have uh, tracking code which uh, tracks their exceptions from JavaScript. And they do get runtime exceptions from their JavaScript code, uh, but not from their Elm code. Um, so it, it is possible uh, to do it, but uh, in practice, it, it doesn't really happen. Um, so what does happen instead is you get really nice compiler errors. So the compiler is checking these types, and the compiler knows a lot of things about how you're using them. Um, so in this example, this error, uh, we're getting it because uh, we 
should have typed email, and instead we typed email with an extra L. So it's a typo. And you know, this kind of error, when it happens in runtime in JavaScript, it really can be more of a problem than you'd expect because uh, the place that you set some property or the place that you, uh, you know, that you configure some object might be a very different place in your code from where that object is used, where the value is used. Um, so you might be looking at a stack, st stack trace and see nothing wrong with, uh, with what's going on at, at that moment. And the error might be in some completely different part of your code that produced the values that you're working with. In Elm, though, the errors are, um, happen at compile time. And uh, they are very nice, as you can see. So, so this is saying, uh, you know, uh, user has this type. It has an email and a name. Uh, but you are trying to use it uh, as something that has an email with two Ls. And it can even say, see that there's this uh, property that's there on the record that, um, that looks a lot like the one that you were trying to access. So it, it says, maybe you meant uh, one of these typos, uh, email to email. So th these compiler errors, they spend the uh, Evan and uh, the others, others who are contributing to Elm spend a lot of time caring about how good these compiler errors are because, uh, because they replace the runtime errors. The, the compiler errors end up being uh, how you find out like, what you've done wrong. Uh, and you can really use them as kind of a conversation with, you have kind of a conversation with the compiler to find out what's up. Um, so, uh, they put a lot of care into them. And uh, here's a tweet from John Carmack, he might know. Uh, uh, he's uh, um, you know, extolling the virtues of Elm's error messages. Uh, this particular error that someone is tweeting about um, uh, is, a, is a different error but uh, about uh, recursive type definitions. But you know, that one is similarly uh, useful and friendly and it has a, a URL that you can follow to learn more about um, how to solve the problem that you have. So one of the reasons why Elm has such great error messages is that they have a whole GitHub repository devoted to improving their error messages. Uh, error message catalog, it's called. And uh, as you can see, that right now there's 84 open, 108 closed messages. Um, uh, some of these take a while to fix because they have to do with, you know, you need to figure out what's uh, really, how, how is the compiler going to understand what's going on in the best way? How are we going to communicate that to the users in the best way? But usually every release of Elm has a few of these that uh, really get vastly improved. Um, so they put a lot of care into it. One of the things that this gets you is really fearless refactoring. So. The way that uh, uh, you know, in, in the way that you might rely on um, extensive test coverage to be confident about refactoring in a dynamic language, you can rely a lot more on the types for that in a language like Elm with a strong type system. Um, this means that you can uh, make one change to whatever part of your program that you want. Um, and you basically end up just following the compiler errors. The compiler just kind of tells you each of the places where, you've, where you're not aligned with the new types that you're using. Um, and uh, and you know, it might take a while, but it's usually, the, because the errors are so well done, it's uh, usually pretty painless. And then by the end of it, uh, because the type system is so, nice and robust, um, it, you can be fairly certain that by the end of it, uh, it's actually a, you know, in the state that you want it. There's no bugs. Um, another thing that the type system gets you in Elm is uh, enforced semantic versioning. So this means that um, if, so I, I mentioned earlier that 
Elm has its own package ecosystem. Uh, if you want to push a new version of your package to uh, Elm's package repository, then uh, it, it will actually automatically update the version of your package depending on what, how your types have changed. So if you uh, only alter the um, behavior of functions without altering their types, then, uh, then it'll only force you to do a patch level upgrade. If you make additions but don't alter anything that's already there, then it'll force you to do a minor. And if you make any changes to the types that are backwards incompatible, then it'll force you to do a major. And you can always uh, force it to do a higher level upgrade if you know that you know, the semantics have changed it in a way that you consider backwards incompatible. But the types will always be guaranteed to work in that way. Um, it's easy to embed Elm inside your existing JavaScript app. So uh, here, so as an example, there's a, uh, a package called React Elm Components. If you have a React app, this package, uh, this NPM package is actually only uh, like 20 lines of code and it's basically just handles the wiring for you to uh, you know, have a React component that uh, passes along the props in the right way to your LMAP, and then you have your LMAP running in a particular part of your React app, uh, and it, it's pretty seamless. It works really nice. Um, there's another project that's uh, maybe not, I, I don't know this uh, reliability of it, because it says like still in progress or whatever, but there's another one for Ember, um, and there might be other ones for Angular or, or whatever. Uh, but as I mentioned, this one is 20 lines of React code to make this component, so it's, it, it should be a pretty straightforward process to, to do wiring for whatever framework you're using. Um, another thing Elm has going for it is really fast HTML rendering. Uh, I, I won't get into this too much. This is from a blog post that, um, that Evan did on the subject. Uh, from actually one version of Elm ago, so things might have gotten a little better by then. Also, things might have gotten better in later versions of these other projects. But you know, the, the this is the first set of benchmarks that the blog post talks about. Um, it, it's actually a really good blog post because it gets into uh, you know why some benchmarks uh, might be better than others and how optimizations come into play. Um, but you know, the important thing is that it's, uh, uh, it's very fast, uh, so uh, speed shouldn't be uh, an issue if you're comparing it with uh, any of these other offerings. Could no one figure out how to optimize the Ember code? <laughs> that's, that's right. Uh, so, uh, I mean, I, I think uh, he put out a call for people to help with it, and uh, uh, it didn't, uh, you know, he, he didn't get any responses by the time he put the blog post together. But um, uh, yeah. So another big thing is that Elm provides one really nice way of building apps. And that's something called the Elm architecture. Um, this is an interesting story of how this came about. Basically, um, Elm has evolved a fair bit since it was re first released in 2012, I think. Um, and it used to have something called signals baked in. Uh, you might have heard the term uh, FRP, functional reactive programming. Um, so uh, earlier versions of Elm were really based on this form of FRP with signals. And um, it, it was a little more complicated to use than, than it is now. Uh, but basically what happened was they, Evan had picked a, a really nice set of constraints for the language. The type system and the way that uh, I.O. Uh, is managed um, with Elm uh, and the way that signals worked meant that you ended up, th these constraints ended up guiding you towards this one way of building apps. Uh, and even beginners who had never used Elm before uh, 
ended up kind of naturally finding themselves building things this way. Because it's, you know, it ends up being the only way that, that works really well. So there's, there's this, these constraints guide you towards this one really nice way that's this one directional data flow. Um, and it's, it's called the Elm architecture, the, the way that you build apps because of this. Um, how many people here are familiar with uh, Redux? Okay, so Redux uh, is inspired by this. Um, and uh, I would say that uh, Redux adds some more things layered on top of it uh, that Elm doesn't, uh, the, the Elm model is simpler. Uh, I won't say if that's a better or worse thing, but um, uh, but Redux and other systems like it uh, have really drawn inspiration from Elm in this regard. Um, last thing, oh, actually, before I get to that, so this is, I'll, I'll show you an example. Um, let's see, okay. Uh, okay, so, So this is um, snagged from the examples on the Elm website. Um, uh, this is, I'll show you. So, okay, uh, I'll back up a bit. Okay. This is, uh, what you're looking at right now is not that program. What you're looking at right now is um, something called Elm Reactor, which is a development tool uh, that comes bundled with Elm and I've basically opened up Elm Reactor in a terminal in the, my project directory, and I can see my files here. And if I click on uh, buttons.elm, which is that file you just saw, uh, I, get, um, I get this rendered by this little web server that's running locally. Uh, so as you can see, this, all this is is a simple counter. Uh, my state is just this number, uh, and I have two buttons that increment and decrement. Um, so I'll just go into the code a little bit to give you a sense of how this works. So this is a very simple um, form of the LMAP architecture. And so, uh, is that, I should probably make that bigger, right? Is that good? Okay, so as you can see, um, you know, th this is using this function uh, beginner program from the HTML module. Uh, you might notice that um, my, uh, my editor has these, uh, has an extension that shows pop-ups for documentation. This is one of the nice things that a type system can give you. Um, so, Beginner program, so uh, this is basically a slightly simplified version of the Elm architecture that you can use if you don't have anything asynchronous going on. Uh, and if you don't have any uh, interop with JavaScript. So um, we basically have three things. We have a model, a view, and an update. Uh, and I should be able to, let's see, I'll, I'll yeah, okay. So. Beginner program is a function which takes a record and returns you a program. So a record is like an object in JavaScript in that it has fields with values, but um, it is, uh, but each field has its own type. So a record has specific fields with specific types. So here, um, the, this record is basically like uh, an options, um, it's like an options object that you might pass to a function in JavaScript. Uh, and these three keys are how you define how your program works. So your model in this case is your starting state. And model colon model there means the model field is of type model, but because it's lowercase uh, model, the 
Um, you, you might notice that some of the other types you've seen are capitalized. So if you see, um, so html.html, for example, is capitalized later on in, in the view function. And uh, uh, so, so those are type constants. So when it's capitalized, it's like an actual type. And when it's lowercase, but in a type signature, it's a type variable. So this means it's, uh, um, it's any type, actually. So this model, your model can be any type that you want. And uh, this beginner program function is a generic function which works using uh, whatever types you want. So I give it a, an, initial, an initial model. I give it a view function which takes a model of the same type as my initial model and returns HTML. Um, and an update function which works on messages. So I'll just go back briefly to this slide. So the, the basic thing that's going to happen is Elm has a runtime, which is going to take care of uh, event uh, management, basically. Uh, and it's going to pass these messages into my update function to transform my model from one moment, from one state to the next. Um, and then my view function is going to be used to render that model. So, Oops. So view is a function from model to HTML. The reason why it has that MSG uh, parameter is it's HTML, which might have buttons or something that produce messages of that same message type. And then uh, an update function, which takes a message and a model and gives it a new model. So, that might seem complicated right now, but uh, I'll show you the it, concrete example here. Um, so here, I'm making an alias for my model type. Uh, it's a very simple example, so I wouldn't have to do this, but uh, this is the convention, that you'd make an alias for your model type called model. In this case, my model is just an integer. Uh, in another case, it might be a record like this that would have a bunch of different things. But in this case, it's just an integer. Um, model lowercase is uh, a variable um, that I initialize as 0. Um, and that ends up what the counter starts as. Uh, then I move on to my update function. So I need to define my own message type, just like I had defined my own model type. My message type is going to be either increment or decrement, because those are the actions that I have available to me. In a more complicated app, I, uh, those some of those message types would probably have parameters associated with them. Um, but in this case, it's just buttons with increment and de decrement, so I don't need any. Uh, so, so this uh, defines a new type, which basically is like an enum type. Um, the fact that they can have parameters means that uh, if you know it, it shares this quality with some other languages where you can have enum types with uh, parameters, but um, but it's basically it's just a type which can have these two values. Um, then my update function uh, it takes a message and a model and returns a model. The you might be wondering why. Um, the arguments and return values are all separated by arrows. Um, I, I won't get into that too much right now, but uh, it, it actually it has to do with the way that uh, um, you can, you can uh, partially apply functions in Elm. I might get into that in the Q&A. Um, so basically, the update function uh, takes a message and a model. And this case keyword um, lets me look at all of the different possible values that 
this message might have. Because it's a, of type MSG, it's either increment or decrement. Um, so in the case of increment, I'm going to take my model and add one to it, and that will be the return value of this case statement, and therefore the function. Decrement I minus one. So just as an aside here, um, so if I remove one of these cases, if I forget one of the cases, let's say, uh, my editor is actually smart enough to show me right here, but I'll reload here. The compiler gives me an error that says I haven't handled all of the cases. So this is kind of part of the um, uh, part of the foundation for how the type system can prevent uh, any runtime exceptions. Um, <laughs> yeah, it is. <laughs> um, so yeah, and I get uh, the same thing if I hover over there. Uh, so let's add that back in. So um, okay, so that's the update function. So you know when I click those buttons, those messages come in. How are the how are they tied together? How do how does it know? Uh, what to do there. So this is how the, what the view function looks like. This is where the buttons and the text are. Uh, the view is a simple function from a model to a representation of the HTML. Uh, this uses a virtual DOM implementation under the hood, which is why it's so fast. Um, and you know, again, this syntax, if you're not used to it, might seem a bit weird. You get used to it eventually. Also, um, there's a really nice uh, tool called Elm Format, which has become pretty standard, uh, and which um, I have set up to, in most te text editors, you can uh, easily install a package that will have it run Elm Format on save. So if I, uh, uh, you know, you, you might notice the, uh, the, fact that commas precede uh, things rather than trail them in, in multi-line lists. Uh, I, if, if you kind of forget about that or don't want to have to deal with the indentation yourself, you can just do it however, whichever way you want. And then when it saves, it can do it the standard way. Uh, so I've kind of learned to, um, well, read the syntax for one. and. Uh, just kind of like let Elm format deal with the details. Uh, so it kind of lets me worry about syntax a lot less. Um, so the way this works is, uh, so this is a div, this first list. So a div, actually I'll just hover over this. A div is, div is a function which takes a list of attributes and returns a list of HTML elements. Oh, sorry, excuse me. Takes a, <laughs> takes a list of uh, HTML attributes and an argument of uh, HTML nodes that are the children and returns um, an HTML node. So, uh, so this first one, if I wanted to put styles in here, I could do that. There's a function to do CSS styles. Uh, any other attributes go in there including uh, event attributes like on click. So um, on click here, so this is how the buttons get wired up with these messages. On click is a function which takes a message which, which might be whatever type your message happens to be. So it's a generic function. It takes a message and returns an HTML attribute which deals with that kind of message. Um, so decrement on its own is, uh, is an instance of this message type. Uh, so I just pass that in, and then that returns for me an HTML attribute, which I put in this list of HTML attributes, um, which is the same kind of list that's up here for the div. Uh, and then in these children uh, uh, of the button, I have the text for the hyphen. Uh, and then here, you know, so text is a function you can mouse over to see. It takes a string and returns an HTML node. So that's 
what we're, these are the kind of functions that we're always working with here. Um, so in this case, I am calling text on the output of uh, to string model. So to string then takes any, any value at all and gives you a string back. Uh, that's like a built-in function in Elm. And so um, this is just an integer, so I'm just turning it into a string and then calling text on it. Um, so that's, that's the gist of it. Uh, I'm over time now, so I'll wrap it up. Um, Elm is really fun. Uh, that's you know the one thing that I didn't mention until now, except that I advanced the slide too early. Um, it, it's it's a lot of fun to use. Uh, part of why it's fun is tied to the re reliability of it in my mind. It, um, it when you're developing Elm code, uh, it's nice to be able to know that uh, you can refactor without worrying too much and you can kind of explore in some ways and, uh, and the type system will help you along the way. Um, thanks, uh, I'm James McCauley on uh, GitHub and Twitter and elsewhere. Um, I, as Dan mentioned earlier, uh, we're starting a meetup uh, called Elm Toronto. Our first event is at Dundas Video in two weeks. Um, look it up and I hope to see you there. Uh, and if you are interested in Elm, uh, here are some links to some, uh, the website and uh, some really good learning resources. Uh, the guide is written by uh, Evan, the creator of Elm. Um, this Manning book, Elm in Action, is written by Richard Fellman. It's in progress right now, uh, but it looks really good. And uh, uh, you, can, you can buy it as an early release. Uh, and this pragmaticstudio.com link is uh, for a video course that uh, I took an earlier version of. They updated it for the recent version of Elm. Uh, and uh, my experience of it was really good. Um, yeah, so thanks. <laughs>